Welcome to Fixing Our Broken Democracy. This presentation is about the Supreme Court decision referred to as Citizens United, which has opened the floodgates to political spending, corrupting our democracy and undermining government of, by, and for the people. My name is Paul Lowenstein. I'm not a politician. I'm not a professional activist. I'm just a retired print shop owner and a concerned citizen. I care about having a political system that empowers people to participate, a justice system that upholds human rights, and an economic system that provides opportunity to everyone. Like many Americans, I see a system that is broken. That's why I volunteer my time to help build the broad movement we need if we want a democracy that serves the interests of all Americans. So what does democracy actually mean? The word democracy comes from the Greek demos, meaning people, and kratia, meaning power or rule, so it basically means the people rule. A large part of the story of how we've ended up with a democracy in need of repair involves changes in the role of what has become the dominant institution of our time, the corporation. In its original conception, the corporation was a way of pooling private resources for the public good. It's an idea that goes all the way back to the Romans, who used corporations to build their famous roads and aqueducts. It was in the 1600s that we really began to see business ventures resembling the modern corporation. The corporation that epitomized this era was the British East India Company. It was one of several corporations chartered by the royal governments of Europe to exploit the resources of other parts of the world. These corporations ended up becoming so powerful that they rivaled the countries that created them. They coined their own money, they established colonies, they negotiated treaties, they imprisoned and executed convicts, and they waged wars. It's hard to overstate the impact that the East India Company had on the American colonies. By 1773, the American colonists were suffering under British laws that hurt them economically. The tipping point came when the British government gave the East India Company a monopoly over the tea trade. They were the only ones allowed to ship tea to the Americas, and once the tea arrived it could only be distributed by people hand-picked by British officials. Local merchants were cut out of the process. On December 16, 1773, a group of Bostonians headed for the ships docked in the harbor full of East India Company tea. They boarded the ships and dumped the cargo overboard. This wasn't just a symbolic act of political protest against the crown. It was a strategic economic protest, an act of civil disobedience against the East India Company and the favoritism it was receiving, squeezing out smaller colonial businesses. So the American Revolution was, in large part, a rejection of corporate domination. Now let's look at the founding documents of our republic that came out of this revolution. The Declaration of Independence stated, All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. This ideal has inspired Americans for generations. And of course there is the U.S. Constitution, which begins, We the People. It's the blueprint for our whole legal and political system. The founders intentionally made it very difficult to change, but it has been changed, or amended, 27 times. The first ten amendments came as a batch in 1791. After the Constitution was drafted and signed in Philadelphia, some states, among them Massachusetts, refused to ratify it unless a list of basic protections for citizens was spelled out. In response to popular pressure, ten amendments were added, which became known as the Bill of Rights. These include the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and due process, including the right to trial by jury. The word corporation is never mentioned in the Constitution, 
The founders of our country had an abiding distrust of corporate power based on their experience with the abuses of the East India Company. As Thomas Jefferson put it, I hope we shall crush in its birth the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations which dare already to challenge our government to a trial by strength and bid defiance to the laws of our country. Here's a quick overview of the framework that the Constitution provided and where corporations fit into it. It started by establishing that people are sovereign. They have rights which are inherent and can't be taken away and are designed to protect individuals from government power and large consolidated power in general. Then from the people, from the consent of the governed, comes the power of government. Government is not sovereign. It doesn't have rights. It has only the powers and duties that we come together and decide it should have. That's the backbone of the system that the Constitution laid out. Then, on down the line, at the state level, government uses the power delegated to it by the people to create something called a corporation. This is an artificial entity. It is legally separate from the people who own it or work for it, and it has specific privileges which are granted to it through the state charter that creates it. The key question is, does this artificial thing, which exists only on paper, have the same inherent rights that we do as human beings? That question of whether corporations should be included as members of we the people is a particularly poignant one when you stop and consider how long and hard Americans have had to struggle just to be considered persons with equal rights themselves. Originally, the rights referred to in the Constitution only applied to white male landowners, only about 5% of the populace at that time. Since then, different groups of people battled for decades to be included in the definition of a person under the Constitution with rights and equal protection under the law. There was the fight for the abolition of slavery and the extension of suffrage to black men, the protection of workers, including children, thanks to the labor movement, the day when women finally won the right to vote, and the progress forged by the civil rights movement in giving people of all races equal protection. Corporations didn't always dominate American life. In the early decades, Americans were deeply skeptical toward corporations. They remembered the East India Company and its impact on colonial business and politics. They associated the corporate form with the rise of monopoly power. So in the early decades of the country, corporations were kept on a short leash by the state governments that created them. They were chartered for a limited time and for a specific purpose. They weren't allowed to own stock in other corporations. Shareholders were liable for the corporation's debts and for damages it caused. In those days, the prevailing mindset was that the purpose of a corporation was to serve the public good. This was even codified in the charters of many corporations in a requirement that, that they do no harm. And when corporations violated these responsibilities, their charters could be revoked. We're going to jump ahead to another era, the Gilded Age of the late 1800s, a time in American history that in many ways is comparable to our own. Who were these heavyweights dominating the Congress? <clears throat> they were the robber barons of the Gilded Age, big industrialists such as the Rockefellers, Astors, and J.P. Morgan. The Gilded Age brought extremes of both great wealth and grinding poverty, as the robber barons made huge fortunes, taking advantage of cheap labor at a time when workers had almost no rights. It was also a time of corruption in government. Lobbyists stalked the halls of Congress and state legislatures with money and gifts to bribe politicians into writing the legislation that corporations wanted. Sound familiar? The owners of corporations wanted to get their businesses out from under control by the states. Led by the booming railroad industry, 
Step by step through the 1800s, industrial tycoons manipulated and bribed state legislatures into lifting the restrictions written into charters. And by now they had their eyes on the biggest prize, the constitutional rights of natural persons. For decades, lawyers brought case after case to the Supreme Court demanding constitutional rights for their corporate clients. They staked their claim on the 14th Amendment of 1868, which affirmed, in the wake of the Civil War, that newly freed slaves were citizens. The 14th Amendment guaranteed all persons equal protection under the law. Up until this time, it had been understood that a corporation was a separate kind of person, an artificial person. What does that mean? Well, let's say a group of people want to go into business together. They file for a charter with the state. Once the charter is granted, the law treats the business as if it were one person so that it can do things like entering into contracts and filing lawsuits. This gives the corporation a limited kind of legal personhood. And that's fine. Corporations need to be able to function that way. But that's really different from saying that they have all the rights of people under the Constitution. These are natural rights that are inherently part of who we are as human beings. There's nothing natural or inherent about a corporation. It's a legal arrangement created by an act of state law. So the aim of the 14th Amendment was to ensure that flesh and blood persons who had been abused for so long as slaves had equal protection under the law. But what actually happened? For years after the Civil War, the, Civil, the Supreme Court refused to acknowledge corporations as having constitutional rights. Then, in 1886, a former, a former railroad president working as a court reporter for the Supreme Court, slipped the statement into the headnote of a decision called Santa Clara versus Southern Pacific Railroad. The court reporter, J.C. Bancroft Davis, wrote that corporations were persons under the 14th Amendment. It wasn't even part of the official ruling by the justices, but it was enough for lawyers to cite in later cases. At the height of the Gilded Age, corporations had gotten their foot in the door. Between 1890 and 1910, the Supreme Court heard 307 cases regarding the 14th Amendment. Only a handful of these cases were on behalf of African Americans. The vast majority were on behalf of corporations. Corporations had the resources to use the legal system for their advantage, while former slaves did not. The Gilded Age did not last forever. People fought back in great movements for change. These included the populists in the 1890s, led by William Jennings Bryan, who demanded the direct election of senators, citizen ballot initiatives, and other experiments in direct democracy. Then came the pro progressives, led by trustbuster Teddy Roosevelt. He said, there can be no effective control of corporations while their political activity remains. The Tillman Act of 1907 banned corporations from spending in elections. As Teddy Roosevelt said back then, the great corporations which we have grown to speak of rather loosely as trusts are the creatures of the state and the state not only has the right to control them, but it is duty-bound to control them wherever the need of such control is shown. In 1920, after decades of struggle, women finally got the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. They had to overcome an 1874 Supreme Court ruling that women were not persons under the 14th Amendment and there was a massive labor movement. All these movements faced resistance from government and corporations and even violent repression in the case of the labor movement. But the people in the movements persisted and won major reforms. After the stock market crash of 1929 and the onset of the Great Depression, 
President Franklin Roosevelt responded to public pressure by putting forward dramatic reforms to put people back to work and make it easier to join labor unions. The social security system was created. FDIC was set up to protect people's money from bank failures. Safeguards such as Glass-Steagall were put in place to stabilize financial markets. These reforms helped to create a golden era in America after World War II. We had decades of stability and economic growth. Prosperity was widely shared as the middle class grew. In the 1950s through the 1970s, there were other remarkable people's movements, such as the Civil Rights Movement, the Anti-War Movement, and the Environmental Movement. Americans by the thousands petitioned, lobbied, marched, did research, and held rallies, all to improve the general welfare. And in 1970, on Earth Day, 20 million Americans from coast to coast demonstrated in the streets and held rallies to protest pollution, oil spills, and other harms caused by corporations. Earth Day was a spectacular success. It won the support of Republicans, Democrats, and all kinds of Americans, and led to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and the passage of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts, as well as many other pieces of environmental legislation. The multinational corporations watched these developments with growing alarm and embarked on a counter strategy. This two minute clip from Heist, Who Stole the American Dream, shows what that corporate counter strategy was. A decision was reached by corporate America that working with unions, uh, working with government, to improve the standard of living for all people was not the right thing to do. Big business doesn't like the government to tell it what to do. They don't want anybody to interfere with their ability to make money in the way that they see fit. In 1971, corporate leaders began to orchestrate a detailed battle plan to eliminate any government policies that might stand between them and profits. The plan was laid out in an influential memo called Attack on American Free Enterprise System. Lewis Powell was a well-respected citizen of Richmond, Virginia. He was a corporate lawyer, a partner in a prestigious corporate law firm, and friends with uh, an executive at the Chamber of Commerce named Eugene Sidnor. And Sidnor asked his friend if he would draft a position statement that he could submit to the Chamber of Commerce that would then sort of form the framework for how to make the organization more able to confront what they thought was a, a growing threat to business interests. Powell's memo laid out a strategy to radically alter public perceptions, ensuring that big business interests would dominate public policy. Powell advocated a vast purge of liberal elements in society. He saw how corporate money could own the media, and talk louder than organized labor and consumer protection groups. But for Powell, a future Supreme Court justice, the real end game was business control of law and politics. The Powell memo and Chamber of Commerce strategy is not a well-known piece of history, but it sure changed our society dramatically. Lewis Powell was a longtime tobacco industry advisor before he became a Supreme Court justice. While he was on the court, he helped decide a number of cases that expanded the power of corporations. Remember the Bill of Rights? Well, over time, partly thanks to Lewis Powell, the rights guaranteed by five of those ten amendments have been given to corporations by the courts. And don't forget, they can also use the 14th Amendment about equal protection for all persons. By today, corporations have been so successful at winning constitutional rights that they can exercise what Concord lawyer and author Jeff Clements has called the corporate veto. This means corporations have the power to go to court and overturn laws passed by our legislatures. Clements is the author of Corporations Are Not People, the one best book to read first on this whole topic. He describes how, 
With corporate-friendly courts, corporations have used constitutional rights to overturn laws protecting our health, safety, environment, and democracy, and they have done so hundreds of times. In his book, Clements gives examples of corporate vetoes that have happened here in Massachusetts. Recognize Joe Camel, the mascot created to market cigarettes to kids? In 1998, Massachusetts passed a law to protect children by banning cigarette advertising within 1,000 feet of schools and playgrounds. The Supreme Court struck down the law, saying it violated the freedom of speech of tobacco companies. That's the First Amendment. How about the Fourth Amendment regarding search and seizure? When OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, attempts to enforce laws regarding workers' health and safety by conducting routine workplace visits, inspectors may be turned away because they don't have a search warrant. This gives factories time to hide violations before the inspectors can enter. While Powell was on the Supreme Court, he wrote or helped write the majority decision in two major First Amendment cases involving the use of money in the democratic process. In Buckley v. Vallejo, the court ruled that you can't limit the amount of money that candidates spend on elections. This is the decision that created the notion that money equals speech. In First National Bank v. Bellotti, a Massachusetts case, the court ruled that you can't limit the way corporations spend money to influence a ballot initiative. Thanks to these decisions and others, we ended up with more money in elections, more attack ads, and more corporate influence. In 2010 came the now infamous Citizens United decision in which the Supreme Court struck down some of the only remaining campaign finance restrictions. Corporations can now spend unlimited amounts of money to influence elections. And since then, things have only gotten worse. On April 2, 2014, the Supreme Court, in the case McCutcheon v. FEC, ruled that individuals may now spend up to $5.9 million on political candidates and parties. Again, they used the argument that money in elections is protected free speech. The popular reaction to all this is reflected in political cartoons such as this one showing the breakdown of limits on campaign funding. And this one showing how money talks. One consequence of Citizens United is the flow of money into elections through new channels, such as super PACs or political action committees. You may have heard about super PACs dumping enormous amounts of money into the last couple of election cycles. This chart shows outside spending in election years. You can see the enormous impact the Citizens United decision has had since 2010. Before Citizens United, corporations had to form special committees to do any political spending, but now they can use their general treasuries regardless of the political views of any individual stockholder or employee. When global corporations buy elections and influence legislation, it can have a damaging impact on small businesses, which are the biggest engine of job growth in America. Organizations representing a majority of small business owners conducted a poll of their members. It showed overwhelmingly that small business owners believe unlimited corporate political spending is bad for them. They can't afford lobbyists. It's the global corporations that have access to our Congress and therefore determine policy that helps them and hurts small businesses. Does this remind you of the colonial period described earlier with the local merchants cut out of the tea trade? Money from corporations and the rich has a huge impact on public policy. In fact, a recent study from Princeton University concluded that America is more of an oligarchy where a small wealthy elite rules 
than a democracy where the people rule. If you look at the policies that actually come out of Washington across issue after issue, they line up with what the rich want and what benefits corporations. What the American public wants has little or no impact on policy. Part of this comes from lobbying, which is a booming industry in recent years. And a lot of it comes from the fact that in order to win these increasingly expensive elections and stay in office, lawmakers have to spend more time fundraising than governing. If you want a second great book to read, check out Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Lessig's book, Republic Lost. Lessig documents in great detail just how dependent Congress has become on funders. He stresses that the framers of the Constitution intended that Congress be dependent on the people alone. But these days, Congress is heavily dependent upon corporate money. So what is the result of all this? What does the reality of corporate rule look like? A system where corporate profits are at an all-time high, while wages as a percentage of the economy are at an all-time low. Healthcare costs are bankrupting families, but the drug companies and health insurance companies are doing better than ever. The banks that crash the economy get bailed out, but homeowners get stuck with mortgages they cannot afford. Private prisons are signing lucrative contracts, which require states to keep the prisons 90% filled. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world, more people in prison than China or Russia. Meanwhile, corporate executives responsible for billions of dollars worth of mortgage fraud, interest rate manipulation, bid rigging on municipal bonds, and even money laundering for terrorists and drug cartels never see the inside of a jail cell. It brings us to a chart you've seen before, except it looks quite different now. Artificial entities now have the same rights that you and I have. Plus, they have the advantage of living forever and existing in multiple places at once, not to mention having billions to spend. People have worked so hard to get to the point where everyone is actually a person in the eyes of the law. And now the courts have invented another type of person. And these artificial persons are drowning out the needs of real people. Remember, it has been this bad before. The nation exists because people stood up against an overwhelming concentration of power. They kicked the East India Company out of this continent entirely, and it didn't end there. Generation after generation, people's movements have fought to realize the ideals of democracy. We've looked at some of the many things we've lost because of corporate power, but we've also seen how much we've gained because of people power. Big change can be brought about when we the people decide we've had enough. It is now hopefully quite clear that we need to create a new people's movement in this country. We call it the democracy movement. The democracy movement has multiple goals, from amending the Constitution to passing state and local laws. But to make that happen, we will need to create a culture willing to challenge the increasingly accepted dominance of huge corporations over democratic institutions. And as a matter of fact, this movement is happening. It is well underway, and it is growing every day in every state of the country. Move to Amend is a national coalition that is working to create a grassroots movement for true democracy. Since Move to Amend was founded in 2010, it has already inspired the creation of at least 150 local citizens groups all across the country, and not just in the liberal states. We believe a constitutional amendment is an essential first step to achieving true democracy. Why? A constitutional amendment is the only lasting way for people to take action to overturn the Supreme Court rulings at the heart of the problem. Once we win such an amendment, we can then pass more pro-democracy laws that then cannot be overturned by the Supreme Court. We can get big money out of our elections 
and then elect representatives accountable to ordinary people. With democracy working better, we can take on solving the many other crises facing our country. That is a plan. So to get started, we must win an amendment to the Constitution that achieves two core goals. First, the rights protected by the Constitution of the United States are the rights of natural persons only, i.e. artificial entities such as corporations do not have constitutional rights. This is referred to by the slogan, corporations are not people. Second, the spending of money to influence elections is not protected free speech under the First Amendment, and therefore Congress and the states may regulate it. This is referred to by the slogan, money is not speech. The founders of our nation provided two options for amending the Constitution, a two-thirds vote by Congress or a convention called by two-thirds of the states. Either option must be ratified by at least three-quarters of the states. And in just the last few years, we've made significant progress toward that goal. Sixteen states have formally called on Congress to amend the Constitution. The Massachusetts legislature passed a resolution calling on Congress to amend the Constitution in July 2012. Nearly 500 cities, towns, and counties, including Boston, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Philadelphia, have called for an amendment. In 2012, citizens in one-third of the legislative districts in Massachusetts put a question on the ballot giving voters a chance to voice support for the two-part amendment that we need. The question won in every district by an average margin of 79%. On November 4, 2014, the question appeared on the ballot in 18 other legislative districts that were not included in 2012. Again, the question passed in every one of these districts by more than a two-thirds majority. In 2014, Vermont, California, and Illinois voted for an amendment convention, the alternative pathway to an amendment. If 31 more states take this action, the Constitution can be amended without waiting for Congress. Will Massachusetts, the cradle of democracy, sit on the sidelines? We have much important work to do in this state to continue to do our part in this national movement. We'll talk about ways you can get involved in just a moment. But first, I want to end this presentation with a two-minute video clip of Move to Amend leaders around the country. If we look back in 50 years, we will realize just how completely and systematically we were being ruled. Of course we had to end slavery. Of course women had to get the right to vote. Of course you could organize unions and they're not a criminal conspiracy. Of course Jim Crow segregation law has to end. Of course 18 year olds have to get the right to vote if they're dying for their country. But this is the thing, Dennis. Every one of those movements seemed impossible when they began. And it was only when ordinary people began to get together and have conversations about how the society is organized and about what their desires are. What's at stake? is the country that I love, that we the people, a country that this was, this was the great American experiment, that could the people rule rather than being ruled by the wealthy or the aristocrats. And we chose to have the people rule, to check or limit the power of government, to limit the power of the wealthy, to hold down the masses. If you're not seeing the kind of change you want, I'd say ask yourself why you're not getting that. And chances are very good it has to do with the fact that our democracy is not working for the people. So whatever your number one issue is, you should make this your number two. Because without this kind of change, it's going to be very hard to win the other reforms that we all want. An issue that I think people used to think was too complicated for regular people to understand. And when it's in front of them, they're voting, you know, not just 50% plus one, not even just 55%. Not even just 60 percent, you know, but 70, sometimes even over 80 percent in support of calling for an amendment. I think that's one thing that definitely proves that there's no question where people stand on this. The reality is that this is a vital struggle. Uh, if Move to Amend doesn't succeed, then we will continue to live in a society in which corporations
call the shots, both in our courts and the halls of Congress and the executive branch, and increasingly at the state and local level. And we've already seen the consequences of that. There are several active move to amend volunteer groups in Massachusetts, but we have only just begun to organize and we need everyone who cares about democracy to get involved. Here are some things you can do. Sign up and tune in at wethepeoplemass.org. Join a democracy club in your local area. Ask your state representative and senator to vote for the We the People Act. HD 1988. Organize a live presentation of Fixing Our Broken Democracy. Talk up this issue with friends, neighbors, and associates. As Margaret Mead put it, a small group of thoughtful people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has.